Well, hello. Today, I would like to talk to you about a pen that has been hiding in an attic for about 80 years. This is a Mold Mole 332. So let's take a look at it. All right. So I think we know where this pen comes from. Uh, they now go by Proto Pens, but uh, they used to go by Uber Pens. So let's uh, open it up and see what we've got. Which, by the way, I have already done. This is just for effect. So this classy pen arrives in a cardboard sleeve with a little bit of cellophane, which is pretty standard for how you receive a Myober Pens pen nowadays. This is kind of a pocket sized pen. Let's see what I've got over here. I've got a Caveco Lilliput. So we're not talking a huge pen. Uh, girthier, of course. And yeah, you can tell it's a little cool in here because uh, I'm condensating on it. But right here, we've got oops, Mont Blanc, a knurled piston turning knob, and at this end we've got a 330 an 8, I think 338. Uh, also, I should mention, the traditional bird splat is a bit understated, but it's there on the finial, and nothing on the other finial. Open this critter up. We've got a nice green ink window, and a knob, or I'm sorry, a nib that says Mont Blanc 14 karat. So we'll do a little glamour shot with a, uh-oh. Somehow I think my desk may not be level. Okay, Chris Rap 52 sent me this as a Christmas present. It's a little, uh, I'm off the subject, but it's a little metal squirrel. He's supposed to be a pen rest, and I thought it'd be cool to take pictures a pen sitting on that pen rest. Not so cool if he won't sit up straight on my desk. At least my desk leans to the left. Okay, I'm, am I going to have to redo all my pick? Ooh, there we go. We got a level spot over here. So, I may have to change how I do my photographs from now on. A little, little trouble here. Doggone. I didn't know my desk leaned to the left. Okay, Chris, I tried. I really tried. So, let's sync it up. So, what are we going to put in a classy pen like this? You know, uh, Mont Blanc is basically synonymous with luxury items now. And, uh... Maybe not so much back at the time this was made, but it is now. So, uh, I don't know. I just think it's a nice Parker Quink washable blue. Don't need my new pen being a snob. So, we'll uncap it. Moment of truth. Mostly with vintage pens, I will uh, clean them first with water and uh, pen flush and so on. With uh, my Uber pens, I typically trust that they're in good shape. So we got a double piston there. I would think from the era that this would have been a cork piston originally. And I'll fill you in on its background more thoroughly after I do the writing sample. But yeah, we got a nice full fill the first time. I'm gonna try tipping this on its side a little. See if we can suck in less air and more ink. There we go. Oh yeah, perfect. I am extremely excited to write with this pen. One thing I will note uh, before I start writing here, posted, which I think this is a pen I will have to post, it is a lot more comfortable and I like its girth. So it looks to me to be an extra fine nib.
All right, so it looks to me to be an extra fine nib. Let me just check my uh, exposure there. That's better. Uh, definitely a lot of line variation there. And of course we use Parker Quink. Washable blue. So as far as flex, yeah, I think this is going to be a fun one. Um, and this, I think, would also be a pen I could use daily as just a regular writer, other than probably this one will never go to school, but that's another story. So wetness and flow, we'll just write casually the way I would if I'm just using the pen. You know, it doesn't take much pressure to get just a little flex, but if I'm doing no pressure, it seems to keep up just fine. Smear test. You'd probably like to see that test. Okay, I didn't think about it, but I did give it a little more gas when I did that, but it seems to be pretty wet. A reverse writing. This one already writes so fine, I don't know what good it'll do, but it's part of what I do in this show. Oops, the cap just came off. Yeah, it's even finer. Um, almost illegible because it's so fine. And then the world famous Pierre Gustafson test, which I'm just going to try to do naturally, not with you know a heavy hand or anything. There might have been one horizontal stroke that it missed, but that I think was me because I might have turned the nib just slightly. On the whole, I don't... I, on my previous screen has kind of low resolution, so it looks like it skipped the, some of these skinnier strokes. But I see them with my eye, and I hope the camera's usually good about picking that up, so you probably are seeing it. It's just, you know, the cheesy little preview screen I have. So on the whole, I'm a happy squirrel. So that's the Mold Bolt 332. Uh, if you couldn't tell, I, I was quite pleased with it when I first got it and I'm still quite pleased with it, it just has a different ink in it now. Uh, this mobile 332, uh, we'll get this out of the way first. I don't have a pocket and it won't fit over this shirt or sweater but it will fit over this t-shirt with no problem. So it does pass the pocket test although I don't carry it that way. Um, this is a pen from 1937 to 1939 somewhere in there, nice celluloid finish. And uh, it was actually called an officer's pen because it was popular with the German officers of the time. Now, how did it end up hiding in an attic for 80 years? Well, when you're talking Central and Eastern Europe, some history happened there. And uh, this pen is a product of that history. So this pen actually uh, was found in North Macedonia, which at the time that the pen was made... I think it would have been part of Yugoslavia. Don't quote me on that. I might have gotten that detail wrong. I know it was part of Yugoslavia after the Second World War. But anyway, uh, this couple was renovating a house in northern Macedonia. Or I should say North Macedonia, because that's the name of the country. And they found 300 pens hidden in their attic. Uh, the story is not completely clear. You know, they, they're not 100% sure how they got there, but they can make some strong conjectures. Uh, they This couple is actually related to a gentleman who sold pens and watches back in the 1930s and early 1940s. And uh, he owned this house. So again, why are they in the attic? Well, probably he was able to sell pens at the beginning of the German occupation because a lot of the stores and such were open and left open at that time but as the war ground on things got worse and there was a new government coming in a communist government and uh, they didn't like upper class people too well 
So uh, it's likely he hid them, hoping better times would come again. And then he, for whatever reason, he never mentioned them. He forgot about them. He decided they were worthless. You know, who, who knows why he didn't pull them out when the everything became more stable. But to be fair, this is a part of the world that has had a lot of instability since the fall of communism. So who knows the true story? But they were hidden and probably hidden away because of the communists. Now, uh, you know, even to introduce these foreign pens would have made him suspicious, you know, if he just one or two at a time. So, yeah, he probably just hid them. Now, the pen brands themselves included a bunch of Cavecos, Reforms, Matadors, National, Mobile, Osmia, Pelican, and Luxor, which are all good German brands of the day. One thing I found interesting, you know, besides the whole story is pretty darn interesting, um, this is a non-telescopic piston, which uh, I don't think I've ever dealt with one before, at least not knowingly. Um, to access it, you actually have to access it from the front of the section. I honestly, if this pen had been given to me not repaired, I wouldn't have known that. I didn't even know there was such a thing. It's somehow it's built in, and uh, you have to know what you're doing in order to rent repair it, which uh, I wouldn't have. So I likely would have destroyed this pen because it never would have occurred to me. But uh, the people who did restore it re replaced the dried out cork piston and put on two rubber O rings instead, which is a repair that I have done with other piston pens. So uh, yeah, it works like a little champ and little. Yeah, this is a little pen. But, uh, I don't know. I'm glad I bought it. I, uh, th this is, uh, definitely at my high end for pens that I will buy with my money. And, uh, honestly, it, I think it was the story is what appealed to me. And then once I got it, of course, I discovered the, that nice nib that, you know, is described by Proto Pens as going from a fine, which is very needle like all the way to a triple broad. So, uh, you know, I don't like to force a pen too far, but uh, you know, it's it's a very enjoyable writer, a very fine pen when I'm not flexing it. And, uh, definitely gives some poof to my letters when I write. So, anyway, hope that was interesting. Hope it was useful. And I did put two links to the story about this pen and others which will show up from time to time on Proto Pens uh, so that you can learn their history too. So I want to thank you for watching. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.